dry air flows over, the asphalt rolls underneath, and I realize I'm headed directly toward a meeting at the horizon with the Milky Way as it bends from one end to the other. As though on its own, the car slows to a stop in the middle of Highway 93 in the middle of the Great Basin Desert. Any car or truck coming from either direction will show long before I'd need to move. Unless, of course, they are driving with their lights off too. <laughs> hmm. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the end of night came almost came out almost five years ago, um, and it's been uh, it honestly it changed my life. It's it's taken me um, many wonderful, beautiful places. It introduced me to a lot of great people, um, and uh, been translated into six different languages and. Uh, I'm just, I'm really grateful for the experience. Uh, some things, let's see, oh, uh, one, of the, one of the experiences I wanted to share with you is, is a story that I tell about going to see the, the writer, yeah, the writer Bob Berman, who some of you may know from uh, his days of writing about astronomy. Um, Bob has a do-it-yourself observatory, as he says, in upstate New York, and he took me out there, um, and he showed me, uh, the moon was out that night, so we looked at the moon a little bit, and then he turned the telescope and he said, look at this. And I climbed up the steps and looked through the viewfinder, and I, without thinking, I just said, oh my god, right? And it was Saturn, uh, and Saturn with its ring, so, so beautiful. And Bob laughed and he said, um, I've shown Saturn through this telescope to more than a thousand people. And, not quite yet, but um, uh, he, uh, they always say one of two things. They always say, perfect, thanks. They always say um, one of two things. They say uh, um, some version of, oh my gosh, or they say, that's not real. <laughs> they don't believe their own eyes. Um, and that's really the story of this book is going out to uh, reacquaint myself with the night and to find out how we've lost touch with night and with darkness. I was really lucky. Uh, I, I grew up, <laughs> I don't know, there it is, okay. I grew up in uh, Minneapolis and we have a cabin like all good Minnesotans up in the, in the north part of the state. Uh, we have a cabin and this is what I grew up with, uh, pine trees and the Milky Way, right? Um, I also like this slide, although I, I apologize. Next it's slide. Next, 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 okay, should we do it that way? Yeah. Can we, okay, perfect. Um, uh, I like this slide even though it's kind of blurry because uh, the moon on the lake is a big part of my experience there. And I want you also to imagine, uh, you know, night isn't just visual, it's also what does it smell like and sound like and feel like. So imagine a beautiful summer night uh, on the shore of the lake and the sound of loons and wolves and frogs and that, that's what uh, became a part of me. Next, please. Uh, as a kid and all my life, I've taken the canoe out into the middle of the lake and uh, laid back on my back and just watched the, uh, the sky like this. I've also had some uh, once-in-a-lifetime experiences and I will read you a short once-in-a-lifetime experience. The most beautiful night I've ever seen was more than 20, this is kind of fiction now, even in this nonfiction book, uh, 20 years when I was backpacking through Europe as an 18-year-old high school graduate. I had traveled south from Spain into Morocco and from there south to the Atlas Mountains at the edge of the Sahara to a place when I look at a map I can no longer find where nomadic tribes came in from the desert to barter and trade. One night in a youth hostel that was more like a stable, I woke and walked out into a snowstorm. But it wasn't the snow I was used to in Minnesota or anywhere else I had been. Standing bare chest to cool night, wearing flip-flops and shorts, I let a storm of stars swirl around me. I remember no light pollution. I remember no lights. But I remember the light around me, the sense of being lit by starlights, and that I could see the ground to which the stars seemed to be floating down. 
I saw the sky that night in three dimensions. The sky had depth, some stars seemingly close, some much farther away. The Milky Way so well defined it had what astronomers call structure, that sense of its twisting depths. I remember stars from one horizon to the other, stars stranger in their numbers than the wooden cart full of severed goat heads I'd seen that morning, making a night sky so plush it still seems like a dream. So much was right about that night. It was a time of my life when I was every day experiencing something new. I felt open to everything, as though I were made of clay and the world was imprinting upon me its breathtaking beauty. Standing nearly naked under that Moroccan sky, skin against the air, the dark, the stars, the night pressed its impression and my lifelong connection was sealed. Uh, a few things have changed since I wrote this book. Next, please. <clears throat> this is Amelie. She was born at the end of April, so she's just over six months. Next, please. She's already exhibiting a fascination with lights. And uh... next, please. Here's the here's the money shot. I think a lot about the future, though, now. I think a lot about um, what her life will be like. And I think, uh, particular to this subject, what experience of night and the night sky she'll have. Um, there's a phrase some of you may know, which is uh, the extinction of experience. That not only are we losing uh, different species around the globe, we're also used, we're losing the opportunity to have experiences that people before us had. Uh, seeing the, a really true night sky is potentially one of those experiences. So I think there's a whole lot at stake. And I wonder, thanks, yes please. I hope her night will be like this, uh, meteors over Lake Tahoe. Next please. It might be like this though. Uh, I think that glare and next uh, light trespass, up lighting like this, Wall packs, we all know these images. Uh, parking lots, this is the Target parking lot in Harrisonburg, Virginia at three o'clock in the morning, lit at the same level that it was lit at when there actually was somebody in the parking lot, right? Next please, we know about gas stations. I was struck by the estimate when I was doing research for the book that gas stations and parking lots are lit 10 times as brightly as they were just 20 years ago, right? So we're seeing that increase, next. Our obsession with uh, safety and security and somehow thinking that sometime that some light can help us be safer, more secure, that means that ever more light will make us ever more safe and secure. Next. We know these images, right? We know that light that's glaring into our eyes going up into the sky, casting shadows actually can make us less safe, uh, less secure as we know from the next image. When we shield our lights, we see the bad guy in the fence. I think this issue is all about the choices that we make. Uh, what kind of lighting will we have? Next, please. I think a lot about, as well, about how uh, the way that we light has always been symbolic. Light in darkness has been symbolic. Unfortunately, uh, for many people, it's broken down into just the simple equation of light is good and dark is bad, right? Uh, yeah, we can go to the next one, that's fine. I remember when I was up in Mont Megantic and I was talking to uh, Sebastian Giguere, some of you know Sebastian, and he said, uh, losing our view of the universe isn't the worst thing that we're doing, but it's symbolic of all the worst things that we're doing, cutting ourselves off from nature. So as I go around, people often ask me, uh, well, what can we do? And are you hopeful about the future? I'd like to spend some time today telling you why, yes, I am hopeful. Next, please. <clears throat> uh, the first reason I'm hopeful is because uh, I think that the work that we're doing 
matters. I remember when I was in Italy and I got to meet Fabio Falci. Next, please. Uh, who was part of the team that designed the World Atlas of the Artificial Night Sky Brightness. Fabio picked me up uh, in his hometown of Mantua and we walked around until it started to get dark and then we went to dinner and if you can imagine this, to me it was an amazing scene of sitting outside in an ancient piazza in, a, in a, the restaurant behind us in a 900 year old building and uh, my Italian friend ordering whatever I wanted on the menu, pasta, and we started with wine and, and went from there. I'll just read a couple pages here, or a couple paragraphs here from, this is Fabio talking. In Europe, we have arrived at the point where we cannot anymore go easily to a dark place. And if also in the United States they don't take action or take wrong actions, it'll be only a question of time. The growth of light pollution is fast, but not fast enough to make people take action. So it is fast, and in one generation you see a lot of difference. But one year to another there is not a lot of difference, and people who are born now are used to the sky, and they don't know what they've lost. The elders remember a long time before when there was a good sky. But it is a strange thing, fast, but not fast enough, or on the other hand, not slow enough. We really don't realize what we're missing. Our children grow without perception of the universe. They grow up without ever having seen the Milky Way or a pristine sky or a total solar eclipse. And these are places that, <clears throat> he says, it, it, all, it is all winds. If we combat light pollution, you haven't light pollution. You have less energy consumption. You have to spend less money for lighting, tax, lighting and taxes. Falke could have mentioned the human health angle or the ecological angle, but the point is that the more you learn about light pollution, the more you see that solving it, it is a win-win situation, or as they say in Italian, it is all wins. <laughs> Next, please. So the updated maps, next please. I should tell you too that Fabio told me that um, if he had the time and the energy and the money, he wanted to create a new atlas that would show what we could do if we controlled our lighting. So here's the problem. He wanted to, to design what I called the ma a map of possibility. Right? Let me tell you one uh, story too about this particular passage in the end of nights. Um, I've been really fortunate. Uh, as you know, people leave reviews on Amazon.com about your book, and uh, by and large, people have been very kind. Um, and I got a f kind of a funny one. Uh, it was actually a four-star review, four out of five recently, but what he wrote caught my eye, and I'll read, I'll read it. He says, quote, some of the book is excellent, <laughs> Some of it repetitious. He is a name dropper extraordinaire. And I really don't care about his pasta dinner with his friend in Italy. <laughs> Bogard is a romantic and approaches the subject matter from that perspective. He is not a scientist, as his credentials reveal a teacher of creative nonfiction. And then this is the best one. The book is worth reading in spite of the flaws mentioned. <laughs> I, I was gonna suggest in the 10th anniversary edition, maybe the publisher put that on the cover. <laughs> so fair enough, I'm not a scientist, um, but I think uh, most people aren't. It reminds me of the uh, saying that I first heard from Chris Luganbuehl, who many of you know, who said, who told me that thinking we protect the night sky only for astronomers is like thinking we protect the Grand Canyon only for geologists, right? It's for all of us. Um, so our work matters, and I think Fabio is a great example uh, of the work being done, as were the award winners uh, earlier here too. Uh, I think our research matters, and in the last uh, five, 10 or even five years, we've seen an amazing uh, growth of research. 
Uh, there's nothing more important to me about this subject than the impact of artificial light, light pollution on um, our fellow creatures, right? And you see so many uh, creatures that are depending on darkness, even more when you add in the crepuscular uh, species that depend on dawn and dusk, right? Uh, next, please. <coughs> We know about the impact to birds, many of us, and sea turtles. Next, please. What we're starting to learn, though, uh, just in the last few years, is how much uh, different animals are depending on darkness. A recent meta-analysis came out just this past year that combined 75 different studies that showed that mammals, they focused on mammals, were increasingly, increasingly using night's darkness as their time to survive. There was a great example from Nepal where they found that in a path through the forest that was used during the day by humans, it was used by tigers at night. <laughs> Next, please. We're finding out an awful lot about the impact of light to insects, right? We're finding out the impact that artificial light at night is contributing to the deep uh, dive in populations of insects and most worrying to uh, pollinators. I talked to uh, uh, recently with uh, Callum McGregor, who's done research uh, on the small elephant hawk moth that you see here, which Callum told me the Latin name translated roughly is um, dusk, dusk loving piglet. <laughs> <laughs> So the more that we know from research, the better we will be uh, able to protect uh, all the different species that depend on night. Next, please. Oh, yeah, I was going to, I'm sorry, I want to, before we leave the, the beautiful Luna moth, let me just read quickly here. <laughs> the Luna moth. Its beauty is ethereal and its nature ephemeral. Ephemeral. It doesn't live much past a week or two. It emerges from its cocoon in the leaf litter, then mates and lays eggs within the first 48 hours. Then it has the rest of its nights with nothing to do, no purpose. It doesn't eat, it doesn't drink. All its energy comes from the leaves it ate as a caterpillar. That energy is finite and cannot be replenished. It's like a toy airplane powered by a twisted rubber band. Once the rubber band unwinds, the propeller stops turning and the plane falls to the ground. Because this happens at night, most of us never see. This moth with its colored wings and long tail, a nocturnal butterfly in the light of the moon, has no purpose as it shares our world while its energy runs dry. No purpose, you might say, except for beauty. If their beauty was merely utilitarian, you'd think after copulating, they would just die. But instead, they stick around for a few nights. I like the thought that this nocturnal butterfly-like creature is out at night fluttering around for no apparent reason, except to make this world more beautiful. Next, please. <clears throat> So our work matters, our research matter, our places matter. This is a place that I talk about in the book. This is a photograph that comes from the great Dan Dorisco. Dan and I were out one night, a very cold night, and I'll never forget the experience of looking east and watching the stars rotate out of the, out of the horizon and looking west and watching the stars fall off the edge of the earth. I'll never forget that kind of experience. Next, please. Uh, and again, I wonder if Amelie will have that kind of experience. Next. Our places matter, like Death Valley, like all the places, the dark sky places that are being protected. And I'll end with the thought, too, that our wonder, our wonder matters, our ability to wonder. When I give talks, this is maybe my favorite slide, I love the image of the independent, the solo human being looking out into space. And what I like to say is that we've taken what was once one of the most common human experiences, which is walking out your door at night and coming face to face with the universe, 
and we've made it one of the most rare human experiences. And we can talk about the many costs to light pollution, the monetary cost, the cost to safety and security, the cost to ecology, the cost to human physical health. There are lots of intangible costs as well, though, because this experience has inspired so much of what it means to be a human, right? So much wonder, so much science, so much reflection, so much religion, spirituality, so much, next please, so much art, right? People think this Van Gogh looks like a Van Gogh only because Van Gogh had his, his personal troubles, but I like to remind them he was also painting a night sky that we don't get to see anymore. He writes to his brother Theo of the star, the different colored stars over Paris. Can you imagine that? Next, please. <clears throat> He loved the night sky, and I love this image because, well, for different reasons, but one of them being that astronomers have figured out that the Big Dipper there was not there that night. I love that he just put it in their artistic license. It was actually behind him. Next, please. I'll leave you with one, another great image from, from Dan, uh, and I'll... read here and then I think we'll have a couple minutes for questions. Thanks again for having me. It's good to be here. <clears throat> Our sun is one star in a disc-shaped swarm of several hundred billion stars, writes astronomer Chet Ramo. That disc-shaped swarm is our Milky Way galaxy and what arcs in three dimensions above this dark Nevada desert is the outer arm of that spiral toward which we look from our inner galaxy location. Ramo continues, I have often constructed a model of the Milky Way galaxy on a classroom floor by pouring a box of salt into a pinwheel pattern. The demonstration is impressive, but the scale is wrong. If a grain of salt were to accurately represent a typical star, then the separate grains should be thousands of feet apart. A numerically and dimensionally precise model of the galaxy would require 10,000 boxes of salt scattered in a flat circle larger than the cross section of the Earth. <clears throat> this means that every star in our night sky, every individual star any human has ever seen with his or her naked eye, is part of our galaxy and its several hundred billion stars. Outside our galaxy exist innumerable other galaxies one recent estimate put the number at 500 billion. At some quick point, the size of the universe becomes overwhelming. Its distances and numbers bending our brains as we try to comprehend the incomprehensible that our night sky is but one tiny plot in a glowing garden too big to imagine. But of course, for all of human history, we have indeed imagined Ancient civilizations from all over the world created constellations not only from the groups of individual stars, but even from the black shapes made by the gas and dust that lie between Earth and our view of the Milky Way's smoke-like stream. And for ages, we imagined it might well be smoke or steam or even milk. Not until 1609 did Galileo's telescope confirmed what he suspected, that the Milky Way's glow was the gathered light of countless stars. In these countless stars, in their clusters and colors and constellations, in the shooting showers of blazing dust and ice, we have always found beauty. And in this beauty, the overwhelming size of the universe has seemed less ominous, Earth's own beauty more incredible. If indeed the numbers and distances of the night sky are so large that they become nearly meaningless, then let us find the meaning under our feet. There is no other place to go. The night sky makes this clear. So let us go dark. Thank you. So if you've got questions for Paul, please come up to the microphone uh, and so that everyone can hear your question. And uh, we'll be... Uh, we graciously, he, he 
caught us up on time. The, you know, the whole Scott thing was kind of a train wreck. <laughs> <laughs> this train wreck's going to step up to my paw. I don't, I don't want to get ahead of you here, but uh, you, you've taken us from the sky to the earth. Could you talk just a moment or two about your second uh, book that you created last year, Tim? Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, people like to say, uh, or maybe it's just me that I like to say it, um, that uh, the first book I was looking up, the second book I'm looking down, uh, it's called The Ground Beneath Us. And it begins with a statistic that stunned me, which is that um, most of us spend 95% of our time inside. And I started to think about it and I thought, and then when we walk outside, we walk on pavement. And it seems so representative of our separations from the ground that gives us our food and our water and our energy and our spirit. So I travel all over to different places um, investigating these different things uh, and it was a lot of fun. It's a good book. What's the title? Uh, the Ground Beneath Us. What dirt has to say about us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yep. Um, so let me, uh, no one's there, so um, how often do you give uh, presentations like this and is it a range of audiences? Is it to you know people who are part of the choir or, or people who need to be convinced? Uh, so the book has been out almost five years. The first two years I did about 25 or 30 of these uh, each year. Uh, in addition, to a lot of radio, which was really wonderful. We had a lot of good coverage. Uh, more recently, it's probably once a month or, or so. Uh, always a range of audiences, a range of venues. Uh, I have spoken in front of um, several hundred people. I have also uh, stood in a bookstore where the, it was the bookstore owner, the cashier, um, <laughs> my aunt, and a, a, a tray of cookies and, and wine. So uh, I've definitely seen the, the range of things. I would say that by and large people are supportive and, and interested. Uh, people have questions all the time. Um, a lot of people have never e even now heard about light pollution. Um, I don't get a lot of pushback, I would have to say, which is fine with me. <laughs> Please introduce yourself also. I'm Patricia Ann Grower, and my question is, which comes first, the art or the writing? I write. <laughs> See, I want to know. The art or the writing? H how do you mean? Well, do you have the, do you have the vision of what you want to describe first, or do you have the writing and what you want to say first? Or do they come together? Um, hmm. I did a lot of field work for this book, so I did a lot of being out uh, at night trying to, at least if I wasn't too cold on uh, some of these nights were very cold, uh, taking field notes, writing down impressions and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, this, the, the, the style of writing that I do the end, in the end of night is certainly true um, of this. It's a blend of scientific information uh, and um, more uh, lyrical impressions and that kind of thing. Uh, I had a goal when I first wrote this book that I could open the book to any page and start reading out loud and it would be interesting. Um, that goal. didn't really happen. It's hard to be... Well, that's a laudable goal. <laughs> Well, the pasta thing, I'm thinking about the, the chapters on the, uh, the effects to human physical health where, you know, it's just not super poetic, but it's important, so. Yes. Yes. I was curious. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, my name is Leanne Musinski, and my question for you is, being that you're um, not a scientist, what inspired you to write the book? Maybe other than you know your childhood experiences and that type of thing. Good question. Yeah. Well, I come out of. I think of myself as coming out of uh, the really um, wonderful um, genre of American natural history writing, and I've always loved nature writing and environmental writing. That's what I wanted to do. Uh, and after college, kind of grad schooly time, I was looking, thinking like, what could I write about? Um, and I've always loved night, and I've always loved uh, the sky, and I started to realize this thing called light pollution. And I just, I looked around and nobody had really written about it, and I thought, I'll go for it. Um, and that's, that's kind of where it came from. 
Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Keith Kruger, and uh, I definitely have enjoyed reading your book, and uh, Thanks, I find myself quoting you sometimes. I'm speaking with to, to other people about light pollution, so I really appreciate your work. Thank you. And um, I think it's really an essential book for anyone who's interested in, in um, this essential handbook, really, for anyone interested in, in, <clears throat> in light pollution, I think. And I was wondering how many languages it was, it's been translated. I mean, you said there was six languages. I was wondering which languages they were. Uh, thanks. Um, Spanish and German, um, Japanese, Mandarin, Korean. There's one other I can't remember. But I'll tell you a funny story about the translations. Um, I was speaking the other night and somebody was really kind to say that um, your writing is really lyrical and you know you said it was translated and is it lyrical in other languages and I said well I don't speak any of the languages unfortunately that it was translated into but I've been told that the Spanish translation was done by a poet and that she did a really wonderful job of capturing the spirit of the book um, the title of the Spanish translation is El Fin de la Oscuridad, the end of darkness, which I think is really poetic and beautiful as well. Uh, and then I was also told that the German version is perhaps less uh, lyrical and poetic. <clears throat> and the title may um, reflect that as well. The German title is simply Die Nacht. <laughs> Real quickly, Paul, since we're talking about your book, when I first picked it up, and those of you who've read it will know what I'm talking about, but I opened up chapter one and it's chapter nine. I said, dude, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a misprint collector's <laughs> item because it ends at chapter one. I said, what yep. is going on? So, yep. well, can you explain? Oh, Let's sure. <laughs> yeah, the, the, uh, I did, when I discovered the Bortle scale, I thought, yes, this is a great um, organizi organizing principle for the book. So. Some of you or most of you know the Bortle scale that starts with nine, our brightest places, and goes down to one, our darkest places. So the book starts with chapter nine and ends with chapter one. Um, and I go from some of our brightest places down to some of our darkest places. So yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to be around the rest of today and, and tomorrow, too. And I would love to answer questions and talk with, with folks as well. I did. I want to take just a minute to tell you about the book that I'm working on right now, a new book, and in case it sparks anything um, and anybody you want to chat about it, I'd love to have that conversation. Um, I'm calling it uh, What Life Will Be Like, and it's a combination of uh, a memoir of telling the story of having my first child, Amelie, while uh, researching the impacts to our mental health and emotional well-being from climate change as we start to realize what's happening and what will is predicted to happen in the future how is that going to impact us so it's memoir and science again uh, and if anybody wants to chat about that I'd be happy to I'm taking it all in right now as I'm writing this this new book so thank you so much for listening appreciate it